Welcome to Full Azure Automation with PowerShell. This is part one of a multi-part series in which I really want to focus on as much as possible the full suite of services available for automation in Azure. But I'm going to start with a sort of core and that centers around the Ad Azure Automation Account or Azure Automation Service and we'll see a lot of things we can do and that's going to center around PowerShell scripts and things like that. So we'll dig in. But of course we need to start with this because this is kind of where everything centers on within Azure. And I do want to call your attention to the link at the bottom. If you go to github.com slash be careful key, you will find my shared subfolder, which contains all of my content for my uh, YouTube videos, as well as much of the presentations I go to when I go on premises or different events. So you can find it there. And this specifically will be under PowerShell Automation. And this content will be a subfolder in that specific to part one. So that'll give you the slides if you want to kind of have that for your reference purposes. Let's jump in. And a little about myself, I'm a Microsoft Technology Solutions Professional. And what that means is I focus on the data and artificial intelligence platform, which includes things like machine learning and big data and all the cool hot technology you hear about today. And my goal is I specifically focus on the healthcare accounts within the New England region. Well, I also pretty much the whole Eastern Coast. And uh, my goal is to do things like this, explain things to people, how do they work, what's the architecture, what's the purpose of different tools. And in a cloud world, there's obviously, there's a lot of different things involved. So I have to keep up with a lot of uh, different technologies, which is great, I love that. But my goal is to make sure people use the right technology for the right problems to get the right solutions in the right place and time and make it all work. So it's a big challenge, but it's, uh, it's also a really rewarding one. I am a two-time Microsoft MVP winner before I joined Microsoft. And also I have decades of IT experience and I wrote a book called Pro PowerShell for Database Developers by APRES. And the nice thing about it is although it does not focus on Azure at all really, very little about Azure, what you learn from it is transferable to Azure Automation since it's, it's how to really leverage PowerShell to the max. I also lead two different user groups. One is the a SQL Pass chapter, which is the Rhode Island Microsoft Business Intelligence, uh, Business Intelligence User Group. And another one is called the uh, Greater Boston Area Data Science, Machine Learning, and AI Group. Please follow me. Uh, follow me on Twitter if you like, uh, YouTube especially. And uh, feel free to join me on LinkedIn. Uh, reference that you found me on YouTube. It's always good to know people are watching these things. Feel free to make comments. I try to follow up on them. I don't always uh, get to them right away, but I try to follow up and respond to comments if there's questions or whatever. Let's jump in. So I want to start with goals. Why do we need automation? in case that's not already obvious, especially, you know, Azure Automation Cloud, uh, PowerShell to the rescue. So this is going to center on PowerShell scripting and why PowerShell is so awesome and what we can do with it. Uh, and I want to focus on something called the Azure Automations Management Suite. And this is kind of an evolved suite of tools that has uh, really been around for a long time. It started on premises, I think it was called the Orchestration Management Suite and things like that and kind of worked its way forward. And now it's something that's really a hybrid kind of tool. So uh, Microsoft realizes that everyone's not going to just jump into the cloud tomorrow, so we've got to get a, a sort of a mixed environment we can support, and I'll talk about that. And then, of course, the core of what I want to talk about is called the Azure Automation Account, which is just a service. It's a, it's a resource we create within Azure that allows us to do all kinds of cool automation stuff. And then I'm going to talk about sort of the center of the automa automation account, which is called PowerShell Runbooks. So this is riveting stuff, so let's jump in. So I want to start out with just kind of talking about the world of cloud and computing on demand because it's it's a pretty cool thing. And, you know, when I started, uh, I started with a machine way back in the day before microcomputers were even really there. And I started on a machine called the Sinclair GX80, which had a whopping 16K of RAM, most of which is taken up by the operating system in the basic language. Worked my way up to an Atari 800XL computer, which was 64K of RAM. Wow, how could you ever fill out memory was the thought back then. That's so much. So it's, it's a very different world today. We can create machines in the cloud in minutes. We can consume and create pay-as-you-go services. And there's things called PaaS and, and SaaS, which PaaS basically means like we don't even want to worry about the underlying hardware, which virtual machines still require us to do. We're creating a sort of virtual computer, but we still have to worry about installing SQL Server or Windows or Linux or whatever we want. We have to worry about releases and patches. But when you go up with a pay-as-you-go service or a PaaS platform as a service, I should say, um, PaaS is platform as a service. You just 
use it as a service. So SQL, Azure SQL DB is a good example. You don't have to worry about releases or patches. Even the backups are taken care of for you. And uh, Azure Databricks would be an example of software as a service. It just does everything for you, and you just use it. You have any number of cores, any amount of memory. You have data platform choices. You know, you can do Linux. You can do uh, Windows. You can do whatever you want. Open source, proprietary software. You can do web and mobile apps, uh, big data support, and AI and machine learning. And it goes on and on. Pretty much anything you can do on computers, you can now do on the cloud. So why automation? Well, uh, last slide should give you a clue. Um, we got a lot more computer resources to manage. In the old all-on-prem world, it's kind of a limited number of machines. You can have only so many machines, and even if you're a large company, even if you have a few hundred, maybe even a thousand boxes that you're managing, one likely it's not quite that big that you're responsible for. That's, that's a lot, but when you get to a cloud, there's no limit to your scale. And so you can have any number of VMs, and you can have ones that are really meant to be only for development during the week, and some that are only maybe going to be spun up for a specific project. And maybe you, d you get rid of the project and go, those go away. So you've got a lot of computer resources, a lot of users, a lot of possibilities, and even architected things that are, like as I mentioned, platforms or service. So you can create web applications with Kubernetes containers that scale it out and all kinds of things, and it would be something you couldn't really do very easily on-premise. You wouldn't have that much hardware. All that means a lot more things to manage. Here's the thing, and I think there's going to be perhaps a, a little bit of a wake-up call for people go to the cloud regardless of which cloud you choose, and that's that if you poorly manage your resources on the cloud, it's not like being on-premise where, well, you've already paid for the server, you've already got it. It really doesn't matter if you turn it off over the weekend. Other than a little electrical charge, it, it's not much, much of a difference, right? But when you don't turn off things like virtual machines or services you don't need or compute things, uh, compute in the cloud, you pay for it. And if, if you're on vacation for a week and you're the only one using a certain machine or service and you don't turn it off, you could be paying thousands of dollars for something that has zero value to you since you're not even using it. So it's really important. It's, it's critical to turn the lights off. That's kind of the metaphor I want to use because you're paying for everything. Uh, you need to scale administration too. Again, a lot more resources means you need to be able to handle automate, or automate your administration of all the resources, whether that's applying standardized security rules or applying uh, policies or just uh, backing up things, whatever it's going to be, you need to be able to scale that. And, you, and I would recommend, the last bullet is most important, when you enter the cloud, start thinking automation right away. Regardless of where you are, even if you're not an IT admin person or a DBA, you want to start thinking, okay, I'm going to be creating lots of virtual machines, or I'm going to be using Azure Databricks and creating lots of clusters and nodes. How do I manage this? How do I keep track of it? Because uh, it can really get out of control pretty quickly, and you need to start thinking about that. How do I kind of create a central administration? The good news is it is possible. It just You just got to start thinking of it early as opposed to later. Because it's easy to get something at the beginning and sort of establish a standard. Maybe when people create a new VM, you could have a, pr you could, you know, I'll, I'll kind of throw something sort of a, a really well thought out process could be anytime somebody wants to create a new VM in Azure, they have a web form and they fill out a request. They've gotten budget approval, we'll say. And that goes into, say, a SQL Server table. And then there's an app that runs maybe every night. And this could be a PowerShell app. It could be on-premise or it could be in Azure. And it looks at this and says, oh, you know, accounting is requisitioned to create a virtual machine in the cloud. Here's the cost center. Here's the approval. And maybe there's some sort of like you, you have an interface to your um, budgeting system. And you do a read to say, is this really authorized? Did they get an approval for this budget item? You say, yes, they did. Great. Uh, what did the resource compute? Maybe you could even set up standards that says based on the amount that they've you know been approved for, they're allowed you know this set level of storage and this much memory. And by the way, you know here's the standard configuration they've asked for, like financial administration. Maybe that means I install you know client tools or something or certain types of products. They use Oracle. We could put Oracle on it. They use Postgres. That's fine. We support all that on Azure, so why not? But anyway, the point of that is you could automate this. Now, what's the benefit of that? It means you're managing the resource. You're validating the person has the right to create these resources rather than having them create it and then find out that, that there was no budget for it and, and your company's paying for it. Make sure that the maybe security rules are applied correctly, patches are applied, whatever. And just having that central, and you can do this with like a PowerShell module, you could standardize such a way that everybody goes through the same process. PowerShell module gets called to create a VM. It has certain parameters and it meets and it conforms to standards. And so you can really kind of get a handle on this right away. You would do this internally, 
But I think there's a risk when we go to the cloud, we sort of forget, you know, we think, oh, it's wide open, and we can lose sort of that sense that we still need to have a process. Okay, so that's my soapbox lecture for this. So I'll take it a simpler route. If you don't go with that route, and then you're in any relationship to IT admin in any way, or DBA, then you're gonna be like the person on the left, stressed out, overworked, too many resources to manage, and you're there at night still trying to keep up with things when anyone goes home. On the right-hand side, you've got PowerShell, you could be at the beach, everything's automated, jobs are running, you may be using agent jobs you can be using here, automation account, and your life is easy. So I hope I've sold you on this because that's the first piece. Now I do have, when I do automation discussions, I find it interesting. There's, there's always controversies in IT. We get, whether it's a certain IDE that certain people like or languages, and one of them is automation approaches. A lot of people really like, and I do too, uh, something called Azure templates. They're basically JSON files, name, value, pairs, that define all the parameters for a given resource, like a VM. They're nice, and PowerShell, I mean, excuse me, Azure will automatically create these templates for you. And you can run them to create you know, new resources. So you can take like a virtual machine template and then create a virtual machine or recreate one. Now, and that's all great. Um, PowerShell is not fighting against these templates. It's not saying you should not use them. However, I will point out a couple of advantages to PowerShell that you, you should use. I would say you should use them with templates because PowerShell can call templates and execute them to create resources. But PowerShell is a full program and it programmatic language like C Sharp or Java or Python. You can do anything with it. And because that's true, you've got complete control with PowerShell and you can really customize it to do logging and recording and standardization in ways that using templates alone, you really just can't get to. I think that's why Microsoft really standardized on PowerShell as sort of the automation language. So use it in combination with any other tools you can that work for you. And certainly templates should be a part of a strategy for automation. So I want to talk a little about OMS because frankly I didn't even realize until very recently just how extensive the automation services in Azure are and sort of when you kind of broaden it a little beyond the automation account which is the second item in this slide uh, it's called autom uh, Operation Management Suite and it goes a little beyond just the typical automation I'm going to talk about and there's a thing called log analytics that lets us monitor and analyze resources and things and manage them more closely and that can be integrated with our automation account as can backups and site recovery and actually a number of other things and I'll try to talk about as much of that as I can it's also uh, something called desired state configuration which is a really cool thing and I'll talk a little bit about that later uh, but my focus will be more on the scripting and what you can do there and again this is sort of a an intro to something will lead to more in-depth riveting stuff that we can cover later. Now there's a link there that has this slide on it. You can find more or just Bing and search for Azure Automation Services or OMS or whatever and you'll find this stuff. A lot of good documentation. I want to talk here a little bit about something and you, you want to understand Runbooks yet and that's fine I'll explain it but Runbooks are just essentially PowerShell scripts that you run essentially as a job in Azure and what I really want to call attention to here is Microsoft again recognizes people are not going to just be in the cloud instantly and so there's a hybrid architecture and you may you know realistically there are definitely parts I think in uh, your IT structure that may never go to the cloud that may not make sense you may have certain things you'd rather keep as a server on premise and you're managing there and so this idea that there'll be a mix a hybrid approach and some of some parts of your environment may be on-premise Linux, some parts of your environment may be on-premise Windows. And so that's what this slide is meant to show. Now, what the cool thing is, you can actually create automated jobs and you can use resources on-premise to do things. So suppose you want to administer and maintain and apply policies or create virtual machines, say, on-premise. You can do that using hybrid runbooks. And what you do essentially is from the cloud, from Azure, you can just kick off tasks to run on premise. So the nice thing and the goal of all this is and Microsoft's been working on this for years, always improving and perfecting. The idea here is you can manage all of your resources in a sort of one place in a consistent way. So that's that's the sale point there. All right, so let me do uh, a lot of things to cover here. One is the portal itself and how do we do things within Azure's portal. So let me start with that and then I'll talk a little bit about creating an, uh, an automation account. So I'm going to pop out here for a minute. I'm going to go over to here, and I'm already in the portal. What a surprise. So when I get into the portal, and it's just portal.azure.com, I think that's that you log in here. And I got a lot of stuff created. 
I'm a very active Microsoft employee. And uh, if so I get a lot of resources, this is what I kind of like to, you get this, you get this dashboard and any things you create that you want to kind of get to easily, it's, uh, it's nice because you can just pin them to your dashboard. Now, honestly, I am biased on this because I think the Azure portal has a great interface. It's a very rich GUI environment. Microsoft has a good history of just making really nice, visually appealing and useful GUIs. And I think the portal is one of those. So you'll see these uh, the labels next to some of these icons occasionally will get compressed and in to give you more real estate. But you start here and um, I can just, I'm on my dashboard, I can see things like I've got a Databricks service. I've got some automation stuff. I've got my data science VMs, etc. All this stuff in one place. I can also just go to all resources, and from here I can filter. And these are these are all the different things I've created. I got a lot. Most of them are not turned on. So if my boss is watching, <laughs> no, uh, not turning all of them on, I'd get in trouble for that. No, the reality is they constrain it. So I, I can only use so many resources. But it's one of the great benefits of working at Microsoft. I get to create these resources, play with them, and uh, it's not something I have to pay for out of pocket. So I always like that. Lots of good stuff. By the way, that's SSAS services. I, I created that so I could do SSAS in the cloud using Azure ADF V2, Azure Data Factory V2. So yes, you can lift and shift SSAS now, but that's another story for another day. All right, so cool stuff here, all kinds of resources. And when you want to go from things, you can you can kind of categorize them. I want to see app services or functions or my SQL databases. All these, the Cosmos DB, which has a multi-model database, things like uh, MongoDB is part of that. Virtual machines, so yeah, I have a few virtual machines. Awesome stuff. And uh, these are data science virtual machines, and I've got another video I talk about how great it is to spin those up to, you can do some machine learning on easily without having to create all your own resources in a custom way. Load balances, storage accounts, I mean, just tons of stuff. Data Factory is our way of, uh, it's basically our ETL for the cloud. So you want to, it's kind of like SSAS, but it's meant for Azure where you can uh, move things around and do transformations and loads. Data Lake Store for big data, all kinds of good stuff. Cost management will let us track things. So lots of stuff here. So let me step back for a minute. But we're here to talk about, oh, and I do want to talk a little bit. If I want to search for things, I can just start typing here like Azure, blah, 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 and start looking for things at like Databricks that you can see. Uh, and this little thing here, when I go to create resources, I'll get messages here, like if I'm creating a VM, and it will be prompting, saying, actively creating a VM. Here I can do different settings for my environment, so a lot of different stuff here. And this tells me who's logged in, which is me. All right, so having, having done that, let's go in and say, I'm going to create an Azure Automation account. So I'm going to go up here, create a resource. And I think there's actually something in here. Let's say recently owned networking. Ah. Oh. Analytics, AI. I think it's under management tools. I was trying to remember where they put this. I vote for the name Automation Guys, but I don't think they listen to me. Uh, so you get a lot of different migration tools and things. And what I'm looking for is the automation account. Now I could also just type in automation up here. Either way, I get to the automation account. And this is related, as you saw in the previous slide, backup and site recovery, OMS, and some other things here. So a lot of different things. But what an application insights is another one that's related to this. But I'm going to go to automation account. And here I just give it a name, like my auto one, whatever I want to call it. I can tell it resource group. So I've, I've probably done this in many videos now, but a resource group is just a container name. Uh, it's actually more than that. It's a container that's going to basically put a link around or a box around everything that I'm creating that I want to associate with each other. So for instance, if I'm going to create, say, accounting is going to have five virtual machines and maybe some blob storage, et cetera, I can say, I'm going to call my you know resource group accounting stuff. And then if I want to get rid of it all, I can just d delete it all in one shot. So when you're thinking about resource groups, try to make sure you group in things that make sense to keep together. It's kind of a nice thing if you keep something like, say it's a new project, which is, you know, uh, you know, maybe a hospital is trying to do a project to see if they can really get readmissions under control. And they call it the readmissions project. You could put everything underneath that. And then they, you know, maybe it didn't work out or they could decide to, you know, go with a vendor solution or whatever. They could, you can just drop all the resources at one shot. You don't have to worry about it. So that's the idea here. A lot said just for that. If I use existing, I can use an existing resource and got some resource groups there. Uh, and then I can say, this is really key. Different things you create in Azure may not be supported in all regions. Uh, Microsoft's got Azure regions all over the world, data centers all over the world. And you can see there's a bunch here. I am kind of fortunate because I'm in the northeast of the US or the eastern region. Usually it's one of the early regions supported by almost anything. Uh, but you can see you do have good support for automation accounts. Well, the idea with the regions is try to pick something that's close to where you are. It just uh, makes it more efficient, faster traffic, 
and this thing here you want to make sure you always say yes it's defaulted because what it does is if you create a run as account when I create my PowerShell jobs it automatically includes uh, the sort of login verification stuff so that it will automatically be able to authenticate and run my jobs and this just gives you more information if you want to know about it learn about automation pricing and I can say pin to dashboard and that will automatically as we saw before print it to the dashboard now I could say create I'm not going to uh, because I want to really take a look at other thing in there other things and, and show you something I've already created but I will point out a few things if I say create it's going to automatically uh, initialize by giving me some starter tools I can use starter um, PowerShell scripts and we'll take a look because I already have them in the example I'll show you with a few other things but the idea there is it's nice because it gives you a starting point so you're not saying okay now what do I do you can actually go in and play with things um, but I create so many of these things that it starts to get messy and I don't have the best automation strategy for myself so I may be a little hypocritical there um, I consider myself not as important to automate as you guys so I'm like the cobbler with really bad shoes <laughs> okay and my shoes are pretty bad at that alright so I'm gonna say uh, just get rid of it sure and go back to my dashboard I scroll over here I create way too many things and I have this automation account right here I can use I'll go right here or I can go right here be Kafka automation actually I kinda really like that little logo and the first thing I can see is it tells me who I you know who what's the name of this automation account be Kafka auto RG as that's my resource group RG I like to put RG what I like to do with resource groups is put RG underscore if I can and then sometimes the underscore doesn't like but that it does so I can find all resource groups easily um, but do standardize on naming too because it, it will make your life easier and you get all this stuff what's my subscription and activity log what I've been doing access control so you get some security things tags is kinda cool the idea behind tags is really just properties I can assign to pretty much any Azure resource I haven't seen any you can't sign these to but maybe there's some exceptions the idea of that is I can I can do things like who, what's the cost center paying for this uh, should this be running 24 by 7 I can basically give it information like critical not critical tags are really great as part of your automation strategy because what I would suggest you do is create a few properties at least one or two that identify things like how critical is this who's paying for it and can it be turned off like can it be turned off on weekends things like that now you can use schedules and things on VMs at certain places that will automatically can turn things off but having these things marked on your resources is great because then when you automate you can just filter you can actually write PowerShell things to filter out and say find all the things that don't need to run on weekends and then disable them and then on Monday you can turn them all on again save you a lot of money I'm here to save you money believe it or not I actually am uh, so if you listen to me you'll save money that's my selling point uh, so okay so configuration management a lot of cool stuff here inventory all kinds of stuff now I wish sometimes I really wish I was more of an IT admin because there's so many cool things but I kind of been coming in for, as a developer on the side really started with PowerShell and get excited about it but I will talk I want to point out this DSC thing DSC is so cool because what DSC does is instead of saying I need to do something let me procedurally check something and do this if then else logic you simply set rules saying I want these software patches always applied and I always want to be up to the latest Windows release and I want SQL Server to be you know at this standard whatever it is and you set the rules and then you just say make it so so the idea is it's, it's just directive based it's rule based saying I've set what I want this is my basic parameters so it's desired state configuration and that's exactly what it is this is the desired state I want and basically PowerShell or Windows or Azure will take care of making it sure it does that which means that how it does it you don't have to worry about so I, I like that it's uh, I don't do a lot with that unfortunately but maybe I'll change that so I can do more training on that as well and then you got this thing called update management and that lets us do things log analytics this is where we can tie in a log analytics space and that will actually let us do more proactive kind of monitoring somebody creates a VM we want to know about we maybe we can apply certain changes to it uh, we can monitor what's going on with our machines etc and our services so that's really great it's not what I'm gonna focus on though I'm gonna focus really here and these are called run books and this is this list here is really the core area of what I want to talk about I'm gonna come back to run books because we're gonna talk more a lot more about that and then you have these shared resources so if you've used something like um, we'll say Windows was it called task scheduler or SQL agent in the SQL database then you have this idea of a job scheduler and the idea is it's generally a batch jobs thing you can say I want to run this at 2 in the morning I want to run this every Tuesday at 5 p.m. or a.m. you have a scheduling tool uh, in Linux it's called cron really powerful absolutely essential to any kind of automation 
I, I can't live without one, to be honest. I have to have these things. Uh, and I love SQL Agent as a good one. SQL Agent is not dependent on a specific tool. It uses T-SQL. You can do PowerShell. You can do a lot of different things. But in Azure, the automation account, uh, the, the main center of it, the core, if you will, and I'll talk a little more about it, is the ability to schedule jobs. And generally, those jobs are PowerShell scripts. A couple of exceptions, and I'll talk about that. But this, so the idea here, I just want to show shared resources. I can do shared resources. I can create a schedule. And the schedule itself is a separate independent object in which I say, oh, I want to run something every Tuesday at 5 or whatever it is. And I just fill in the parameters for what it is. And I can make it recurring or single time. And then it will create it. So I've got a few here, like I want to run Tuesday at 2 p.m. You can see this. So it's saying starts here, ends here, recurring, one every week, only on Tuesdays, set expiration, no. That's the idea behind it. And you can see what's it going to run? It's going to run this run book right here. That's the idea of this. So, so it, it's showing me the schedule, and then it's showing me I could have many different jobs or code scripts attached to the schedule. Modules, these are really meant to be PowerShell modules we can attach, and Python modules potentially. I'll explain that a little later. But the idea with modules is I want to upload things. Now you can see in modules, you get all these Azure Automation ones and standard ones. And you can see here, UMD Azure and UMD Azure Automation Data, yeah, UMD underscore Azure Automation Demo. Those are specific modules I've uploaded, okay? So I wrote my own custom modules, which is something I highly recommend people do, cut, get things specific to them. If you want to create virtual machines on a regular basis, you can certainly take my code and extend it. Uh, but what I would say is write a standard function in your own custom module to do this because it allows you a lot of extensibility going forward. Maybe today, really simple, you're creating a basic VM. And maybe in the beginning, only VMs you're really creating are all SQL Server ones. And so you have certain defaults. Down the road, you start to get more complicated and you start to find out, oh, we're having problems with people having the authority to create these things. I mentioned earlier, and it's kind of going through these demos or concept how you could do this. So if you create a standard function, you can extend it. That's my big takeaway. So maybe in the beginning, you're not logging the fact you're creating virtual machines, and you realize you don't know what's happening. So you could add to this stern, standard VM creator function logging facilities and even a notification to send you an email saying, I've just created a VM. And so that's the idea. Like if you create central code, you can extend it, and you can extend it in one place. You don't want to keep duplicating code, or you're going to get out of control very quickly. Standard. You know, keep it simple kind of software development ideas. So I've created these are my custom ones. Now I always have a, a standard prefixing for my modules. These are just PowerShell scripts. If you've done Python, you know py Python scripts are also modules if you just import them or load them as a module. Same idea with PowerShell. Just PowerShell scripts. They have a .psm1 extension. I'm going to do a whole separate talk on PowerShell modules, script modules, they call them. But the idea here is, so this is one I have. I go in here. Uh, you can see these are the my own custom things I've created. And I name it with UMD so I know it's mine. That stands for user defined module. It should probably use probably should be UDM. Okay, you got me. But UDM, user defined module, or UMD. Uh, and you can see in here these and even my naming of my commandlets. I use the standard verbs because Microsoft doesn't like it if you don't. Uh, but I, I use the noun side. I put UDF, user defined function. So I know these are my things. They're not Microsoft's, they're not standard custom code. If I want to load a new module, I can just say add module, and then I can say go find it, and then I just go find my module. By default, your own local modules will be under Windows, under your documents folder for your account, Windows PowerShell modules, and you can see all these ones out here, and you can see I have got this UMD database. Now, there's one little thing about this, though. You have to take, when you do a module, okay, it has to have a folder name which is the name of the module and then within the folder you have something like we'll say oops not a good example let's do UMD Azure since I know that has what I need and uh, let's gonna do this and so in that folder you would have to have the same name as the folder UMD Azure and when you import the module that's the name you give it so the folder name by naming the folder name the same as a module PowerShell can find it. Long story just to say that. However, when you're going to upload it, what's a requirement is you have to do a zip. So you have to zip up the folder and then you upload the zip. So I'm not going to actually create one here and I'm going to do a separate thing hopefully later on just explaining that. But if I wanted to upload one, 
I can do it here, for instance. So maybe I, I will pull this in. I'll, I lied. I'll do this. I'll pull in this UMD database just for you guys. It's a zip folder for my module. Hopefully it'll work. Um, I think I'll try the ETL one. That looks shorter, hopefully. And I'm going to say, okay, unload it, bring it in. Okay. Can't guarantee it's going to work, though, to be honest. I don't know if it's a good module or not. Uh, but you can see it here now. UMD ETL, there it is, and the awesome. Might still be pulling it in. You can see I mentioned here that messages occur. And that's the main point, though, is now you can see it's there. So that allows me to bring my own custom code in the form of modules into PowerShell. Not designed for individual scripts much, but more the reusable code side. So it's a really important piece. You also have a modules gallery. Okay, so these are all different pre-written modules we can just pull in and use. Take a look around. There's so many great useful modules out there. Do not reinvent the wheel. I have. That's how I learned PowerShell the hard way. Do not do what I did. Uh, and you get things like credentials. So really cool thing here is we can create credentials so that we can use those credentials to authenticate automatically. Connections and things. We can create our connections. And this is the cool thing. Remember before we said, yes, please create these run as connections. So these run as connections are going to allow us to automatically connect within our run books to the resources. So whether you're in Azure or you're kind of connecting from outside, you still got to make sure you're who you say you are and you have your authority to run things. That's what this run as thing does. It gives us those credentials. We have our certificates, which is just another way to authenticate. And variables are really kind of cool. Think of these as more as like save parameters. I can do things like create server names and maybe like account names or company names, whatever I want to be sort of standard variables. And I can then take these variables and pass them in as parameters when I'm running my run books. And again, run books are just my jobs. So these standard, these shared resources are really important. They're going to be key to us later. We'll come back to those. Some other things we have workspaces and things we can pull in. And again, that ties back into more extended OMS services. Event Grid is pretty cool because what Event Grid does is it allows us, Event Grid is actually not technically part of PowerShell per se or this account or ad automation. But what it is is it allows us to hook into events happening within Azure. So we could, for instance, say, you know, somebody drops a file into blob storage and we want to fire off something that will load it. So that's kind of the idea and many different ways of hooking into Event Grid. I see Event Grid as being a placeholder that Microsoft's going to be able to really extend in the future to allow us to pretty much fire off PowerShell jobs whenever we need to for almost anything. So it's kind of a, a great thing. And uh, we have to we have to subscribe to events. So the idea here, if you know, says subscriptions. If you've ever done this in Windows, it's in my book. But uh, you can subscribe to events like file creation events and things within the environment. And that's kind of the idea here. An event happens, and it's really just an action in the environment you want to be notified about. And you have account, account setting keys, pricing, etc. Source code control. If you want to integrate this with GitHub, excuse me, GitHub or whatever you want to use, that's there. Uh, you run as accounts again. In here, you can create. You have your run as accounts. You have locks, automation script. I mentioned this earlier. Automation scripts. Uh, what that really comes down to is again, it's just a really a JSON file, and you can see it here. These are things we can run, and you can see some variations on that. It's a lot, a lot of cool stuff. So, all right, I'm gonna do a quick overview, go into some more describing things, and come back to more of a demo. But let's, uh, here's the core. I kind of skipped over this for intentionality purposes. Runbooks. So runbooks is really our jobs. That's it in a nutshell. They're scripts. But we can schedule those, as you've seen with the scheduler. And they can do anything we want. And we can call scripts from scripts. So we can sort of nest them. We can have PowerShell modules loaded. And we can call functions. So it's a very powerful thing. We can pretty much do anything in the world. Um, and what's really cool here, though, is there's several flavors of PowerShell scripts. Now, I, I like to code, take that direct control when I write my code. I don't like to use anything that isn't code, to be honest. I like it just to be there. Uh, but there was an orchestrator feature that a lot of users liked. A lot of people who do this are not programmers and, uh, you know, good IT people. And that's, you don't want to have them not able to do things in the, or they have to step back and say, give me six months while I learn how to code. And so the idea here is you can do a, a visual layout. And so this is where people can actually create run jobs or PowerShell jobs using it visually. They can create things. Let me close that out. Um, and it might be easier if I said, let's edit one. I think that'll give me a better sense. So if I go in here, you can see there's properties being set. If anyone's ever used SSAS or something or Visio, 
the idea is you click and you set properties and say, I want you to do this. And these really equate directly to PowerShell commandlets within a module. The only downside to this that I find uh, a little disappointing is it would be really cool to me if you could do this and then say, okay, turn this into just a straight PowerShell script. That has not been uh, added yet. You know, if you're out there, vote it up. I, I'd love to see that, <laughs> but it's not there. But you can see I can I can also do things here, get to commandlets I want to use. I can do I can call runbooks in, assets we can see. We can see our variables and connections, credentials, etc. Uh, all kinds of st cool stuff we can do. All right, so let me get out of these. I, I don't really use the visual runbooks because, again, I, I feel like I don't have enough control when I do that. But it's a cool thing for people who, who want to use those. Uh, so let me go back. Here's a cool thing. Python 2. Not 3 yet. Looking for 3, to be honest. But we've got Python 2 support. So we can actually run, and it's in preview, I believe, now. So it's not uh, quite there for GA. But we can now start creating Python runbooks. So if we want to make our jobs, we're good at Python, we're coming from that world, we have the ability to do that. And if I go in here and say edit, you can see this is typical methods in this case. Uh, it's not a class, so it's really just a function. Uh, but we can do all the stuff and we can import modules as we're doing and run code and, you know, cool stuff. I really love the fact that they put Python in here. I think that's, you know, big thumbs up to Microsoft for doing that. Because uh, as much as I love PowerShell, it's awesome. And I'm very comfortable with PowerShell. Python is hard to uh, ignore. It's it's, a, it's just blazing. It's, it's really popular. It does everything. And it runs everywhere. So by putting that in, you just extend the power of our environment for automation extensively. Uh, and we can... Know, kind of call things in and use them in all kinds of cool stuff too. So we get a lot of uh, features here. Okay, a little bit hanging there. So let me go back here for a minute. Okay, so we've seen uh, graphical runbooks and we've seen the Python. And now we're going to see uh, regular PowerShell scripts. And I will talk about one that's not listed here. They don't give you one out of the box, which is called a workflow. A workflow runbook is a PowerShell script, but it ties into the Windows workflow uh, library which allows you to do uh, parallel processing and stop stop something in the end and we pick it up later like you can say do a sync point and restart so it's all that kind of stuff originally if you've heard of like run books original the first run books ever created were only workflows uh, which was kind of interesting because that would have I thought been the more difficult place to start with in this automation uh, but so they're cool and they're great and they definitely have a place uh, but if you don't need that kind of thing I, I, I like I'm, I'm working my way towards the standard PowerShell script. So let's, you know, if I want to see a standard PowerShell script, here's one. And by the way, all these ones you're seeing so far are given to you right out of the box. As soon as you create an automation account, it gives you these free ones to play with, you know. Uh, so it's great. And when I buy free, I mean it's just they're created in your account. So I'll say I'm going to edit this. And notice if I want to schedule this, I just click on the scheduler. And it says, okay, link it to a schedule. And I can do that. So I can just say, I want you to run every day at 2 o'clock or something like that. But let me go back. Um, Oh, and I didn't mention webhooks. So many things, and it's just like I could go on forever here. Um, little tidbit. To cover all the automation possible in Polish, uh, in Azure could take a month of training. Definitely a full week, no problem. I'm working on trying to turn this into at least a day of training, which is not going to be enough time. Webhooks are really cool because what they do is if I want to create a webhook, I can go in here and say create new webhook. And I give it uh, the webhook name, but then what it's going to do, you notice it gives me a URL. And so what that URL is meant to be is it's a way to call my PowerShell script from outside of Azure or from somewhere, maybe even within Azure, just to call it via a link. So I think that's pretty cool. All right, let me go into edit. And so this is a typical, you know, run book in, uh, in Azure. We have a connection name, run as connection. And this block of code from here to here. Okay, so all this code here is really just authentication code. It's trying a dip, couple of different attempts of how am I going to authenticate. So the idea when I run the run book is it's just going to sign in and do authentication and stuff and make sure that it can run stuff. And then this is just going to list the VMs that I have, you know, that type of thing. That's the idea. So all the code that's really working is just that. And I can go here, and these are modules and things. So if I want to bring in a, a commandlet from a module, that may be a big one to open up. Uh, I can do that and say Azure account, and yeah, cool things, service principles and stuff. So you get a lot of cool things. But so if I wanted to bring something in here, I could just say yeah, drag that onto the canvas. I think actually, sorry, 
add to canvas and you notice it inserted the commandlet with the parameters so it's kind of easy to kind of play with things see what you're going to do and you get all these different uh, modules that you can use when close that storage rm compute etc and notice i can also use my own umd azure i can add my own commandlets so it's a great place to develop things i can also call other runbooks so if i want to i can just say oh uh let me again put this here uh add to canvas Yeah, I should have done that. Hmm. Not sure why it's not allowing me to run this. Let me. I'll oh, probably could. Let's try this one. Okay, <laughs> took a while, but eventually it did do it. Um, but the idea is I can run these. Now, let me take it. Kind of overdid this. So I'm gonna clear that out. All you need to run it is the period and the name of the run book. And if you're going to be in the same folder, what you want to do is say period and then this. What this what this period does is it says whatever you create, functions, variables, keep it in memory. Don't get rid of it. This part just says run the run book. And the period backslash is actually saying it's in the current folder. So what I typically do, can I give you, I'm going to pull something. What would I actually do? What I do is I cut and paste this entire section that does the login for myself. And... I take that and I'll make it a Azure login. So I go here and say add to canvas and voila, that's going to log me in to my account. If I want to make sure it, it keeps anything. You notice it's creating variables and things. What I usually do is this. So I know it's keeping things in memory and it's calling my script. So I can nest my run books and when I do, I can keep things in memory. So it's a great way to, to kind of consolidate things, kind of modularize things. Use it between using modules, calling scripts. PowerShell is really cool in that you can call a script, just a regular script, and you can still pass parameters just like a function and return things. So it's pretty cool that way. Um, so I wanted to show that. That's how I kind of set a standard login, and then I strip out all this extra login code. Because, again, the key to automation and the key to good programming practices is um, really pull things out. That if there's any kind of duplication, you're going to reuse code, put it in a separate function, where you can extend it, modify it, and things in one place as opposed to sprinkled throughout all of your different scripts. And then somebody says, oh, yeah, we changed that commandlet. And now you have to go back to maybe a thousand scripts and, and manually fix it. Um, if you've been a programmer, you, you've you been burned by that sooner or later, and you learn the hard way. Uh, so, it, so this script's here. It's good. Um, I'll give you an example of what I mean here. So say so, yeah favorite to publish so there's an idea when you're working on scripts publishing it publishing is the version that you want to to run but you can then be you know making changes and edited so go back here run books I want to go look at one in particular demo list tags and I'm gonna take a look so you can see these show recent jobs so these are things I've scheduled it it runs doesn't really do much so I'm not taking a lot of money I have it on a schedule I can say edit this and nice here, what I do is see it's notice it calls the script to log in. So you don't see all that extra code. Again, maybe every time I log in, I'd like to at some point take that script and have it logged to a table. I could also have it send an email somewhere saying, you know, somebody logged into your system, somebody's running a job. So the idea of doing this is, is just a small but really critical thing. Centralize your code, extend it, you know, using reusable functions is my favorite thing, script modules with functions. But at least reuse scripts if you're going to redo the same thing over and over because I could now parameterize it and add a lot of extra functionality that may need, maybe I didn't think I needed in the beginning. And I don't have to go to every script to now extend that functionality. And here I'm just going to list resources. And then I write this little message. And uh, here's a cool thing I can do. I can say test. I'm going to test this. And it goes here and says, okay, you're going to test. And I can say, okay, start this. Now I'll give you a little warning because it confuses you. If you've run this before, previous messages very slowly display and it almost looks like it's running but it's not you have to click the start button and it takes me you can see queued queued this is not the quickest operation but you know it's uh it's not so painful you have to go get dinner and come back so hopefully this will run quick enough that we can see the output ah excuse me all right so yeah there it goes log into azure so that's that script Headsets are not easy. Okay. 
okay and that you see it here so it's listing my VMs that's about it and that's all it's doing so it's nothing you know all that big deal you can see there's I don't have any parameters okay but if I did they would pop up as little boxes I could key things into so a really nice thing I think there's some in here I can show you but just like you would standardly put in uh, parameters for any script you can do that with run books and then pass them in or fill them in dynamically you know or manually when you come to them so it's really cool uh, let me go here go back here um, yeah so let me see if I have uh, create blobs good one so the idea here is to create blob storage um, so I can do edit okay so this is a function that I'm running and notice in this case and yeah you could run this without the function name but I've got a function I've got parameters going on uh, so this actually will only create the function unless I create something around it but you can create functions like that and then run them and if I wanted to to actually execute all I have to do is kind of remove this and that would call the function that I'm creating uh, so I'm not going to bother doing that what I'm really looking to do is kind of show you uh, parameters so let's say okay to that Yeah, that doesn't really have one. Okay, I don't have a good example here, but I will look for one. I'm gonna do one more time. I was hoping to find I had I thought I had one for this. This one might have it. Start VM on the schedule. Perfect. So this is one that Microsoft gives you out of the box, which is one of the reasons I really like using those so this is one that was in the gallery and you can go here and it has these parameters so if I go to uh, the test pane you can notice it's asking me for what VM do you want to start what's the service name task name I can fill these in and it's filling in the parameters so I can do it you know automatically on a command line or when I run the script or I can do it manually and that was the thing I wanted to show you here okay so I'm gonna get away from that all right, cool stuff. If I want to create a new run book, let's see, add a run book, I can say create a new run book or I can say import an existing run book. And you have different types. So these are the run book types, PowerShell, Python 2, graphical, PowerShell workflow, or graphical PowerShell workflow. Um, Okay, I think if I do here, let me see if I can, oops. Oh, so if I want to import something from my own machine, like my client machine, I can go here and I can find something and then import a script. So that's the idea behind that. Uh, then the type of runbook I want to create, et cetera, name. And if I go here, this is just to create a, not importing one, but I just want to create something like test. Runbook type is PowerShell create and then that just creates a new script for me and I can go in here and do that all right all right so we got a lot of stuff in here I think somewhere in there I also have a point there is a PowerShell gallery here for creating scripts so when you're for PowerShell modules there's a gallery we saw that and also with scripts we can uh, also go to a gallery and pull up scripts and there's a lot of you know predefined scripts and things that we can pull from so we want to be able to do that um, so I think that's really good. Yeah, browse gallery. Those I was looking for. So if I want to get scripts that are out there, you've got tons and tons of scripts available. Have at it. You know, don't recreate the wheel. Just uh, you got to make sure though the scripts are the right type. Some may be workflows, some may be graphical or whatever. But find the one you want, and you can go at it. And it's great because you don't. And you can check off here like, okay, I don't want these. I just want. Oh, and then maybe I want. I don't care which publisher. Okay. And then these are all just PowerShell scripts that I'd want to use. And not to mention, there's all kinds of, you can just bang around and search for PowerShell examples and stuff. Be careful, though, if you're going to use modules. You know, a lot of this stuff is coming from anywhere, and you, you want to make sure you know what the source is, that it's not going to be trying to hack in or do anything malicious. So, warning given. All right, I think we're good here. 
I've tried to show you everything. And this tough thing about doing training videos like this is you're trying to think of everything possible. If I was doing this live, you'd be asking me questions, but you can't do that. So hopefully I've covered everything, but I'm going to go through some more slides because obviously slides are riveting. So let me kind of step through here a bit. So what we saw is when we want to create the Azure Automation account, which is really what lets us run jobs and set them on schedules and do all kinds of stuff, we can do that by just clicking that plus button within the portal and then going into uh, Management Tools, or we can just start typing Automation, and you find it and just click it. And Or you, like I show here, Typing Automation. And the one advantage of the typing it, locating it wise is good is sometimes, you know, Microsoft's trying to improve things, they move things around, and sometimes where you thought it was isn't there anymore, so the other way will, should always work. And here we're saying, okay, adding an automation account, we need to give it a name, we need to tell it what subscription we're using, uh, what resource group, which is just a container to put it in, what region, and remember to check off the create run as accounts, it's a, it really makes it your life a little easier, and you can pin it to the dashboard. And we looked at all these different types of runbooks. So we saw a desired state configuration is one type of automation we can do. Did not get into that, need to learn more about it. I'm really fascinated by it, it's really cool. Uh, but the, the ability to run runbook scripts, which we also found there's graphical runbooks, there's graphical workflows, there's workflow scripts, there's, uh, and then Python support and all kinds of cool stuff. I think that I have another slide for that. We also have jobs. So we, jobs are the idea we have a schedule process. We can go into jobs to see like history of jobs running, et cetera. We have the runbooks gallery. We can see that there. Hybrid workers, I didn't get into to actually setting up. It requires you to set something up on your, your on-premise side to, to be able to kick those off and run them. Uh, not difficult, but you do need to do some work there. Watch your tasks. I've talked about the event grid, but watch your tasks are in a, sort of another similar thing where you can think it's like, you know, file gets created, something happens, you're, you're watching for that event. Um, okay. And um, let me go back there also. And remember shared resources, schedules, modules that we can upload, modules gallery, so we can find modules that we might find useful, and a number of ways we can ver basically authenticate when we connect. Variables are just things we can, you can see it down here. Variables allow us to sort of set sort of like parameter names. Maybe we have a certain VM name that we use a lot or a prefix to things we could pass it in, whatever makes sense. All right, and we saw again all the different types of runbooks. We don't have, by default, they don't give you a creation of a workflow runbook, but we got a lot of other ones to, to start off with. So what you're seeing on this screen is if you create a brand new Azure Automation account, you get these scripts out of the box, ready to go. You're gonna look impressive right away. Tell your boss you created these from scratch. He'll be amazed. You just started it 10 minutes ago and you're like, we've written all these scripts? Yes, even in Python, even in Python. And you don't know Python? You don't, okay. Anyway, just messing around. It's Saturday. All right, so kind of reviewing this too, runbook statistics. When you get in here, you can you can look at runbook statistics, which just comes at the top and input output and things. You can click on output to see you know, what a runbook's done. And uh, when you create a new runbook, we looked at this with type of creating, editing. So here's the, the deal. What I'm gonna do later is talk about how we can use the rich custom IDE and PowerShell on our client machine and integrate that with the Azure Automation account. Because as much as I like the, automa order, yeah, the Azure Automation account, I don't really like working in a portal editor. And I, it, for a portal editor, it is good, but it's just not as good as working on my own machine. I like to work locally and test locally and stuff, and there's a cool way we can do that. But it is good, and, and I wanted to show you this. But And I also, this slide is meant to show you, uh, we got this parameters. So we can put parameters in, a couple of key things. You, to put parameters in, if you've done functions and things in the past, with PowerShell, then you may not have used uh, this format, but the param statement, which is how we define formal parameters. And so we can see it here. Many ways to pass parameters in PowerShell, but the param statement is good because it activates certain functionality. And I always push the idea of a command line binding, but as far as I can tell in uh, runbooks, the command line binding isn't really necessary to get the support for things like write verbose and things like that, but uh, you can play around with it. It seems like it's kind of the default behavior from what I can see, but uh, command led binding at the very top is meant to support what they call PowerShell common parameters. A lot of stuff here. And this is just showing some of that. And this is, uh, you know, different pieces that you can get looking at a runbook. We've seen a lot of this. We talked about uploading a custom module, and what did I tell you? Must be zipped. So I'm going to go into more detail about how to create custom script modules and all that good stuff. You can get some on the internet, you can get them all over the place. There's the gallery, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, but the idea is PowerShell Power script modules are awesome. You're going to want to use them. It's, it's really a centric piece to really good uh, best practice automation, all that good stuff. Uh, but anyway, you can upload your custom modules, which if you couldn't, we'd have serious limitations, but we don't, so we're good. All right, now I did my runbook demo. I did all that good stuff. I kind of combined them instead of this slide because I knew you guys couldn't wait. So wrapping up, what I hope I've proven, and by the way, while I'm yak yakking here, you can see my link again, github.com, bcafferkey slash shared. Please go there if you want these slides. Um, so wrapping up, we've covered the need for automation. We've covered PowerShell to the rescue and how PowerShell helps us. We looked at uh, Azure OMS, and I kind of looked at like various services and ever-growing set of services that kind of integrate into the Azure Automation account. As far as I can tell, I am not really an expert on OMS as much as I'd like to be, but it looks like the Automation account is really kind of meant to be the hub for OMS, and then you can spin off these extra services and create resources. And we looked at PowerShell Runbooks in great detail, what they do, how they work, etc. And we're going to do more on these things, but I wanted to give you sort of that high-level overview. The most important thing to Azure Automation, in my humble opinion, is the Azure Automation account and all those resources it creates for you. If you want to work completely in there, you can do so much. It's awesome. But I will talk about ways to even make it more awesome by extending that with like on-premise, on your own machine type of work, good stuff like that. So thank you for being with me on this riveting tour and I use that word a lot now uh, gotta get off to another word I'm gonna copyright it I think or trademark it but uh, it, I hope you've enjoyed this it's got a lot of information covered I know it was long if you stuck with it then hopefully you got some things out of it uh, feel free to like share tell all your friends please subscribe because it just uh, it helps me the more subscribers the more I become a, a uh, YouTube superstar helps me uh, I'm not sure how it helps me but it will help me somewhere and I hope you got this so have a great uh, Great day, and thank you for watching this.